Welcome to module two. In this module, we are going to be focusing entirely on chapter four, the earth, moon, and sky. And our two big topics that we're going to spend the most time on are the seasons and the cause of those seasons and the phases of the moon, being able to understand them and predict them. This first video is going to lay out the groundwork of some of the smaller topics that will help us understand those larger ones. We will be talking about three smaller sections of the chapter, and then we'll be able to move on in other videos to those other bigger topics. Now, the first thing we want to talk about is how astronomers are able to pinpoint exact locations on the sky. Now, if we think about module one, we talked about constellations briefly in the celestial sphere, and we may have in discussions talked about the fact that stars and constellations are kind of like cities and states in the US. If you live in a city, a well-known city on maps, that's great. You can tell someone your city and state and they'll find you. In the same way, if we are looking at a very bright star on the nighttime sky, it probably has a name and is in a certain constellation and it's easy to pinpoint that location. However, what if we are in the middle of a field in the middle of nowhere and we still need to get a precise location? On Earth, we do that using latitude and longitude. So I wanna do a quick reminder or overview, it depends on if you've seen this in a different class or not, of what these are on Earth so that we can make the connection to what astronomers are using on the sky. Now on Earth, latitude has a physically meaningful zero point, the Earth's equator. As the Earth spins on its own axis along the poles, the North and South Poles, Earth's equator is perfectly in between those two points. And so as it spins, even if we were able to erase all of the maps that we are familiar with, all the continents and the oceans, we'd actually still be able to draw out where the Earth's equator is. Latitude then is telling us how far north or how far south of Earth's equator we are. The North Pole is all the way at 90 degrees north, and the South Pole is all the way at 90 degrees south. Okay, so we'll keep that in mind as we continue. Longitude is a little bit tougher though. Longitude does not have a physically meaningful starting point. Now, all around the world, we have to agree on a starting point, but it could have been chosen to go anywhere. I like to make this connection to um, beach balls. We have one in, cl in class when we're uh, on campus and we have one on a picture on our slide now. Imagine that beach ball is actually the earth, but we've taken all of the continental boundaries out, all of the um, countries and oceans and everything, and all we have are these little colorful sections. It will still spin around the two points that are the poles. One of them is shown in this picture, that white circle. But there's no reason why the yellow-green boundary is any more important than the white-red boundary. But we pick one, and then we can start to count around the circle from there. Greenwich, England is the representative zero point. The line of zero degrees longitude is called the prime meridian, and it runs through Greenwich, England because of social and um, political ideas at the time when longitude was set up. It is not physically meaningful in the same way that um, latitude was. The other thing to keep in mind for longitude too is that although it is measured in degrees on Earth from zero all the way to 360, we can also describe it in terms of time. Now, here in Grand Rapids, it's kind of easy for me to remember that we live at 43 de degrees north latitude. And that's because when I look at the sky, the North Star is 43 degrees above the horizon in altitude. That's an idea that we talked about in module one. But I actually don't have the longitude of Grand Rapids measure, uh, memorized. It's not useful for me. It doesn't really come up. But what I do know is that I'm in the Eastern time zone and my friend who lives in California is not on the Eastern time zone. They're three time zones separate. So we tend to, in everyday circumstances, think about this East-West um, set of differences in terms of time already. Now those time zones were set up because as the sun rises, it appears in the sky at different times for different locations because the earth is rotating it into view. If we actually look at a map of time zones, 
they're really complicated because, again, of political and social um, decisions that were made. But when you're looking at them in the middle of the ocean, where there are no islands to worry about either, they are nice bands of different time zones, where the idea is sunrise is roughly around 6 a.m., 7 a.m. for everybody. Sunset is roughly around 6 p.m., 7 p.m. for everybody, when possible. So time zones are kind of like longitude, and that's actually the connection we want to make to the sky. For astronomers, when we are describing the up and down kind of direction, on Earth we talk about latitude, and on the sky we talk about declination. That is worth writing down. Declination is measured in degrees, just like latitude is, and it's relative to the celestial equator, the same way that latitude is relative to the Earth's equator. And then the left-right direction, on Earth we talked about longitude and time zones, and for the sky we actually measure that in time. That term is called right ascension, and it starts at a zero point that everyone had to agree on. It's called the vernal equinox, and that term is going to come up when we actually talk about seasons. So I'm going to kind of set it aside, maybe it's worth writing down, but we will explore that term more in a different video. And then we count from zero hours all the way to 24 hours for right ascension. So when we are thinking ahead all throughout the semester, when astronomers try to talk to each other about where to look for all of the different objects that we're going to think about, all of the different cool events that they study, they are often using declination and right ascension in the same way that people can use latitude and longitude on the ground here on Earth. Okay. This pair of images might be useful to take note of, maybe say images on slide eight to look back at, because this helps us make the connection that the side to side longitude versus right ascension and the up and down latitude versus declination. Okay. The next thing that we wanna talk about in this introductory video is making sure we have a sense of how our understanding of time is directly related to astronomy. Now, the sun and the stars both rise and set, or they go around in circles, because the Earth is rotating. So for example, constellations like Ursa Major that contain the asterism, the Big Dipper, they go around and around in circles every single day because of the Earth's rotation. But if we were looking at stars that were roughly around the same path that the sun takes, there is a small daily difference of four minutes. That difference comes from the fact that when Earth spins exactly once and brings us back to pointing at the same stars, it hasn't yet gotten back to being in line with the sun. This diagram does a really good job of showing that, where we have a person in orange, where on day one, we're describing noon for that person, the astronomical noon, the sun's highest point in the sky that day. And if we go once around exactly, they aren't at noon yet until they swing a little bit more to face the sun again. And that's why that orange um, person is along the dashed line on that day two. That would be noon again for that person. That's the solar day. That's one rotation relative to the sun instead of relative to the distant stars. We don't need to memorize that 23 hours, 56 minutes, and we really don't necessarily need to memorize the sidereal day term, but I do want us to recognize why the stars are moving slightly differently than the sun. It's because we are orbiting the sun, but we aren't orbiting those distant stars. Now, with that in mind, we've now started to think about what a day means in terms of astronomical objects and cycles. I want you to pause the video and think about out of this list, which ones, if any, are based specifically on astronomical cycles or motions. So pause the video and think about it. Okay, hopefully we paused. Now, we just mentioned a day, so hopefully you um, named that one, the fact that the day is based on the Earth's rotation. One thing to specify even further is that that 
day, the 24 hours or 23 hours, 56 minutes, just the general idea of a day, that's true even if somebody, some alien race completely stole our sun and we no longer were orbiting anything, we would still have that day, that motion of the Earth spinning. Now, if you tried to come up with an astronomical um, description of a week, you may have talked about how it's a quarter of a month, something like that. What that really means is a week is a useful thing for humans to be able to keep track of months more easily. But months are in fact based on another astronomical object, the moon. Now, so one day at the top we've talked about, one month is based on the orbit of the moon around the Earth. Even the name comes from moon, a moonth. Although if you go around and tell people that, they might laugh at you if you call it a moonth. And then a year, the Earth is important, but the thing that really defines the year is the fact that the sun is in the middle of the path that we are making. If, if that alien race stole the sun, we wouldn't have a year anymore. Our year is based on how close we are to the sun, and it's 365 and a quarter days long. The current calendar that we use as a human civilization is right to about one day in 3,300 years when we properly include leap years. The leap years are there because a year has an extra quarter day, and so if we don't account for that, we're going to um, really start to lose track of our year-to-year -year location relative to background stars. And so we add that in roughly every four years. You're welcome to um, look back up in the textbook the exact way that leap years are included. But I do want to point out a couple of key things. Days, months, and years. Earth, moon, and sun. That's something that's going to come up as we talk about seasons, as we talk about the phases of the moon. And I want us to start to be more aware of the way in which astronomy really does affect our daily lives, even if we aren't thinking about it in that way. Now, before we move on from this section, I do want to point out that I said our current calendar that we use, and I, I want to make sure we understand that that's not the only calendar that has existed. Ever since humans needed to keep track of time, they have figured out ways to do so using astronomical observations. So Stonehenge, for example, was built between about 3000 before Common Era to about 1500 before Common Era. And it was used for um, probably a lot more than we are aware of because there are no written records. But what we do know is that the location of certain stones outside of the known circle align with where the sun and moon rise and set throughout the year. The most famous one for Stonehenge is summer solstice, certainly, but there are different locations that are kind of marked like this ancient calendar of sorts. In addition, I want to make sure we recognize that it's not just the kind of Western tradition that came up with useful calendars. The traditional Chinese calendar is also based on astronomical observations, but they spend more time focused on the moon. And that's because the moon is something that doesn't quite line up with the way we think of years and, um, and days, but it is something that is very easy to track. It is worth noting that the 12-year orbit of Jupiter is also something that the ancient Chinese astronomers were paying attention to and is built into their um, zodiac and their astrology in ancient China. And then the last example that I want to leave us with is the Maya in Central America are one of many other cultures that we kind of forget how far they were able to come, but they had observatories designed to be focused on these um, motions of the sun and the stars and the moon in the sky. And so the Maya focused on counting days very accurately. They never tried to fit a lunar month, and they didn't even try to fit a solar year, but they were very good at building these large-scale calendars that could keep track of days properly. The key thing is that all of these require paying attention to what's going on in the sky, and that's what the rest of our module is focused on. 
the seasons and the phases of the moon and how they really are something that we can keep track of with fairly simple observations if we're, if we're paying attention. So I will see you in those next videos.